hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. In the lovely history of the Jamaican music industry, we've seen many gifted crooners bless our eardrums with wonderful songs about love and matters of the heart. The best known of these legends include Gregory Isaacs, Dennis Brown, Delroy Wilson and Alton Ellis. In terms of pure talent and ability, the subject of today's video would easily be listed among the greatest Jamaican vocalists of all time, if not number one, if he hadn't had his promising life cut short at a very young age, in tragic circumstances that are painful up until this day. Possessing one of the greatest tenors in the history of Jamaican music, he was blessed with a distinct piercing voice that conveyed the overflowing emotions that he poured into his singing and performances and was considered by his peers in the ska, rocksteady and early reggae era as the greatest vocalists of his time, with reggae historians and authors like Steve Barrow and Peter Dalton describing Slim Smith as the greatest vocalist to emerge in the rocksteady era. He was also a great instrumentalist and exquisite songwriter, remembered by people closest to him as the true artist who wore his heart on his sleeve and was reggae's first true sensitive lover boy before the likes of Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaacs became the poster boys of that kind of persona. In his short career, he unleashed a chain of hit records for Jamaica's greatest producers as members of different groups and also as a solo recording artist throughout the 1960s. But as he was coming into his own in the 1970s, he passed away suddenly, bringing one of the most promising careers to a sad end before it could ascend to the next level. It's almost exactly 50 years since he left this world so let's take a look at the life and tragic end of Slim Smith. He was born Keith Smith in 1948 and grew up in the West Street area of Kingston, Jamaica. Like many artists of his caliber, he displayed an amazing level of interest in music as a child and by the time he enrolled at the Kingston Secondary School, it was clear where his life path was headed. It was while still a student that he became lead vocalist of an ensemble called the Victor's Youth Band. That group would come to prominence when it won first prize in the ska and mental category of the Western Kingston and Jamaica Festival in 1964. In that same year, he would hook up with a close friend of his named Winston Riley. Along with two other guys named Franklin White and Freddie Waits, they would form the vocal harmony group called The Techniques. Incidentally, Freddie Waits' two sons, Freddie Jr. and Patrick, became the rhythm section of 80s UK reggae band Musical Youth two decades later. The techniques cut their teeth, performing at school shows, street corners, and nightclubs such as Edward Thiaga's Chocomo Lawn Club. In 1965, they were introduced to popular producer Duke Reed and went on to release a string of hit singles under his Treasure Isle record label that were very successful in the charts. But about a year after, the two friends in Slim Smith and Winston Riley were driven apart by many differences and this led to Smith leaving the techniques, though they still remained close friends. He went on to work with Coxon Dodd as a solo artist at Studio One and it was there that the legendary producer, observing his slender physique, gave him the nickname of Slim Smith and it immediately stuck. Seemingly energized in the Studio One environment, Slim Smith would release some beautiful tunes that would define that era. By 1966, the frenetic tempo of Ska was slowing down to the more mellow pace of Rocksteady and this slower pace seemed to be the perfect foil for his clear, exquisite tenor that channeled the spirits of America's finest soul R&B vocalists who were the biggest musical influences on Jamaica in those times. Smith would deploy his soulful weapon of a voice and create fantastic songs like Hip Hug, Rougher Yet and the awesome Look Who's Back Again which featured ace vocalist Delroy Wilson, tracks which have since featured in compilations of the best of Studio One. But as was the usual story with Studio One and its artists in those days, Slim Smith parted ways with Coxone Dodd in 1967 over money issues. Coxone Dodd was deeply upset with Slim Smith's decision to leave Studio One, but Smith's mind was made up. It was after Studio One that he began to collaborate with legendary producer Bonnie Stryker Lee, and that partnership would record a massive level of impact on Smith's development as an artist. Smith operated very fluidly in that period and scored a big hit called Born to Love You with a group called The Sensations. But with Bonnie Lee's guidance, he formed his own group called The Uniques in 1967 and sang on lead vocals along with Roy Shirley and Franklin White on backing vocals. The Uniques quickly became among the biggest acts in Jamaica and released smash hits back to back with songs like Let Me Go Girl and Do Rock Steady. Powered by Slim's incredible vocals, they were the hottest thing on the concert circuit. 
in shows held in major venues like the Regal Theatre, the Carry Theatre and the State Theatre. They were always the main attraction and always stole the show no matter who else was on the billing, even totally outshining the Wailers on more than one occasion. After releasing more hits like Gypsy Woman, Love and Devotion as well as Watch This Sound, the Uniques would break up around 1968 after releasing their only album titled Absolutely The Uniques, with each member going on to do their own thing. Smith resumed his journey as a solo artist, still under the guidance of Bonnie Lee, and would release some of his most iconic material. My personal favorite and one of his most iconic tracks is the simply sublime My Conversation, which featured the usual exquisite soulful crooning of Smith, riding on one of the greatest reggae instrumentals of all time. That particular instrumental has been reused by countless artists over the years and packed a serious punch after half a century. I've left a link in the description section for viewers who would like to enjoy the song after watching this video. Smith would notch incredible hits like I'm Lost, Build My World Around You and Rain From The Skies. But his biggest song was a cover of a Motown classic titled Everybody Needs Love. A song which had been recorded earlier by the likes of The Temptations and Gladys Knight and The Pips. That song was also produced by Bonnie Lee and recorded at Coxon Dodd Studio One. And interestingly, Coxon Dodd was at the studio at the time of the song's recording and was still very upset at Smith leaving Studio One and reportedly made some snide comments at Smith. Bonnie Lee reportedly told Smith to ignore Dodd and sing the song before rolling the tape. As if determined to prove a point, Smith sang his heart out, leaving everybody in the studio, including Coxon Dodd, simply stunned. And upon release, Everybody Needs Love it would fly up the Jamaican charts and eventually became his biggest hit in 1969. His debut album as a solo artist came out that year and was also titled Everybody Needs Love. Slim Smith was a consummate artist and spared no expense to keep his music pure and even passed upon a song that would become a worldwide smash hit. The reggae legend Max Romeo was at the time working as a songwriter and vocalist for Bonnie Lee, writing songs for artists under his management like Slim Smith and Derek Morgan. Romeo wrote a song titled Wet Dream and when Lee checked it out, he just knew that the song was a hit in the making. Lee offered the song to Slim Smith who refused to sing it after seeing the naughty lyrics. Eventually, Lee would force Max Romeo to sing the song and it became a monster hit all around the world. But that didn't matter to Smith as his own music was blowing up internationally and he would go on a whirlwind tour of Canada, France, Germany, Sweden and England. After what seemed like a lifetime in music, it's amazing to note that he was just 21 years old at the time. But despite all his seeming success, it's said that he was suffering psychologically under all the strain of working non-stop for years, as well as experiencing the disappointments of working so hard for so many producers and seeing very little money for all his efforts. It's also been rumored that he was very unlucky in love and experienced heartbreak at the hands of several ladies. It's not been confirmed. But one particular story has it that after a tour of the UK, he returned to Jamaica and caught a girlfriend with another man. His painful experiences have had many music commentators wondering if the raw emotive quality in his voice and music was as a result of the pain in his private life. As the 1970s unfolded, it marked the ascendancy of reggae music along with its conscious and militant themes. And Smith also began to evolve, doing more conscious material and headed towards a Rastafarian consciousness. Many people believe that this shift was also inspired by his personal problems. But unfortunately, his mind had begun to crack and he began to develop mental issues, which even led to him spending time at Kingston's Bellevue Sanatorium. He quickly recovered and went back to recording with Bonnie Lee, but he was clearly struggling with a fragile mental state. And one of the last pictures taken of Slim Smith was a promotional picture for one of his last songs, aptly titled The Time Is Now, which was released in 1972. In the picture, he clearly looked disheveled and not the usual dapper figure from earlier album covers. And a year later, the most awful and unimaginable would happen. On October the 9th, 1973, Slim Smith, feeling frustrated at being a superstar but still broke with almost no money, went out to have some drinks and smoke some herb with some friends one Tuesday night. Despite being a world famous artist, he was still living with his parents and when he got back home that night, he found out that the door was locked and he couldn't get in. It's said that in anger, he punched through the glass panel door to try and open it, but in the process, the broken glass accidentally severed an artery in his arm. It's unclear whether he was too intoxicated to call for help, but in the morning, Slim Smith was found dead, lying by the door the next morning 
due to a loss of blood at the young age of 24. And that was the tragic end of Slim Smith, simply one of Jamaica's greatest ever talents. Ultimately a sad story of a prodigy who was brought down by a combination of factors in his private and professional life. A maestro who put together some of the greatest reggae compositions in the history of the genre, like my conversation and I'll never let go. One can only imagine what he might have achieved if he had lived longer. He was simply one of a kind and his incredible music continues to get re-released and rediscovered by new generations of reggae fans with the passage of time. The most recent being the album Resurrection which was released in 2004. He will continue to live on for all time through the beautiful soulful music gems that he left behind. Slim Smith will never be forgotten. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, jobless.